and welcome to The Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me elsewhere online as The Crimson Stitchery. Relevant links for things that I mention in this video can be found in the show notes and the down bar below here on YouTube as usual. Hello and welcome to an October edition of my studio vlog, also known as a knitting podcast. I am really happy to be joining you this month once again with an update about what I've been making because I've been doing a little bit of knitting and quite a lot more of crochet in fact and in this episode I'll also be updating you on my artist residency. This is a current ongoing project which I am doing that I introduced in the last episode of the Crimson Stitchery which I recorded at the end of August. I'm currently in the middle of an artist residency and research placement at the archive of the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. It's an amazing project and really, really fun. And there have been loads of developments since I last recorded um, and updated you about that. And I've also got a larder life section too. We have the return of larder life, what with the real onset of autumn. And before I get into things, this episode is coming to you courtesy of all of my lovely and wonderful supporters over on Patreon, who help keep the Crimson Stitchery going through monthly men membership subscriptions. I really love sharing my creative endeavours with you over on the Crimson Stitchery, recording tutorials and vlogs just like this one, and I really couldn't do it without the support of people like you, members of the audience, who enjoy it too. Your membership subscriptions help me cover all of the ongoing costs of running the Crimson Stitchery, such as equipment and software and so on and so forth, but it's also a wonderful way of meeting other people who are similarly minded, who enjoy making things, thinking and talking about making things, giving and sharing generously. We have a really, really lively online community that are quite active over on our private community Discord server. So if you enjoy the Crimson Stitchery and would like to get involved a little bit further, do hop over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to check out all of the various different benefits and choose the right tier for you. Thank you so much to my patrons. <laughs> so in a very typical way for the Crimson Stitchery, just as I started recording, the sun has beamed through my glass patio doors and I'm feeling really rather warm <laughs> in my wool sweater. This is one that I knitted um, a few years ago. I mean, it's a cardigan. It's a really, really popular pattern um, and I knitted it using yarn that I bought on holiday in Paris in, I think it was in 2017, early 2017, which feels like a very long time ago. Not only was it pre-pandemic, but it was pre-PhD. <laughs> so very, very happy memories and gorgeous, gorgeous yarn. And yeah, it's kind of odd to be feeling really slightly warm right now because it has got really rather cold here in London, UK, which is where I'm based um, on some mornings it's even been five degrees celsius i'll put the fahrenheit on screen uh, really like very cold <laughs> according to my tastes but i'm not complaining i will take the sunshine where i can get it so in terms of my knitting and crochet projects, as I mentioned at the top of this episode, um, I have been continuing to be really, really quite busy. I've got quite a full life at the moment. What with doing this artist residency, I'm currently right in the middle of pulling together an exhibition. Um, at the archive at Q, and that has been a lot of work. <laughs> um, and I was, I've been really fortunate in order to do this creative artist residency because alongside the historical materials about 19th and early 20th century plant collections across East Asia, I am exhibiting um, some creative responses that I am also devising to those as an artist. And it is really this just, it's just been this absolutely delightful project project um, where it's really been a chance to develop my creative work because you know as viewers of the Crimson Stitchery will be aware you know like the slogan of this video channel is making things that are beautiful and useful but actually in my own creative and intellectual life I've actually been really craving to explore things that do not have any obvious use or purpose and maybe they're not even beautiful and maybe they are more abstract so I've been really really longing to explore that side and so the project's been a great way of bringing together lots of different facets of you know my sort of intellectual pursuits um, but at the same time you know I'm working at Kew Gardens which is two hours door to door from where I live because it's on the opposite side of London. It's so far away and that's been really tiring um, commuting. And then, you know, even if I'm working from home, it's just been like very full on. So all that to say is that I have been enjoying like the most simple crochet projects 
imaginable. Um, I actually started and nearly finished this crochet baby blanket um, through September and into October. So that's, you know, been a good six weeks of working on it. And oh, these are all of the colours. It actually started as a scrap project and I pulled out from my stash, I had seven balls of 100% cotton DK yarn. And I really had the feeling, you know, this is really typical of me. Whenever I work on scrap projects, a lot of the time I end up running out of scraps and I just have to mix in whatever yarns I can find and make compromises or even, depending on the size of the project, end up buying more yarn, which is always really annoying. Um, so with the yarn that I had with the seven balls, let's see if I fold it, I got up to here which is a pretty decent size. Um, it's probably about, you know, 50 centimeters or so, half a meter maybe. So over a foot, maybe a foot and a half, something like that. But it wasn't quite big enough to be a baby blanket. And um, I just kept imagining like, what if the baby was there in the middle and you were wrapping it, you know, how, how much bigger would you want it to be? So I knew that it had to be bigger than than this size or it would just be a glorified table mat um, and I should probably say that the baby belongs to baby well the baby is still unborn um, it's like some some friends of ours um, yeah continuing you know being in my early 30s now there is a trend of you know at least one wedding and one baby that arrives a year so crochet uh, projects um yeah crochet projects are great uh, to fulfill that you know gifting impulse i did think about making a sweater you know previously for the last couple of years i've made one baby sweater a year but what with being so tired and you know having this like really stimulating and quite demanding project going on um in my quote unquote day job, job I really just needed something really simple and a big simple crochet blanket with everything in trebles um, or double crochet according to the American terminology you know just like the basic crochet, crochet stitch just essentially a granny square that just gets bigger and bigger around around the outside just by increasing at the corners you know I just needed something really really easy to do uh, and repetitive and I could just move my hands on that you know four hours of traveling a day at, at times um so yeah I went for the baby blanket rather than a jumper and to be honest with you I loved making this blanket I could have gone for longer um but anyway so I got up to this size which was you know over, probably over half a meter um and then I went and ordered more yarn uh and then I think you know, I couldn't quite match the colours, you know, I didn't, couldn't match the brands of yarns for what I had. So I'm not sure if you can tell. I think it's come out okay. It's hard to tell on camera, but um, for example, like the orange, the new orange that I bought is much more muted in comparison to the old one. You know, like every shade is slightly different. The new grey is more blue, the new white is more grey than the old white. Um, the new blue was quite similar, but it was more rich and just brighter. I didn't buy a new green. The new red was a lot brighter as well and just had a different vibrancy. But actually once it's all together, and I think especially because the parents of the baby are not, um, I don't, you know, I don't think they're as sort of visually detail oriented in the way that I am, or maybe you guys watching, I really don't think that they're going to notice. I'm not gonna point it out to them. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's fine. Like once you hold the whole thing up, you would really have to be trying to be very negative if you wanted to be like, oh, look, that orange is more muted than the other orange stripe. So the baby is a boy. Um, and I love all of these bright, cheerful colours that just came together from the scraps that I had, as opposed to, you know, pastels or a white baby blanket, um, or even like a, a blue baby blanket, because, you know, girls like blue and green as well. And, you know, men and boys like red and pink. <laughs> so we've got all of the, the colours. And um, yeah, as you can see at the beginning, now I've got to finish weaving in the ends. I've done a few, but I've got that task. 
Um, it took a few goes to get this blanket right, even though it's just a big granny square, because when I initially um, chained on um, for the crochet project, I wasn't increasing enough at the corners. And so it was creating this sort of tortoise shell shape, um, which became a very hat like, um, which was a bit annoying. So I just, you know, unraveled it and started again. And yeah, like I said, I, I could have honestly, I could have kept going on this blanket and made it even bigger. Um, for the border, I've done this scallop. And what I did is I did one row of single crochet or doubles, you know, the very tiny basic crochet stitch, the first one that you learn. And then I went in and did these shells around the edge so that the shells had, you know, had the same color red border to kind of hook into, um, but then it wasn't too chunky. And again, I think that's just a nice little, little detail that just, you know, helps elevate the blanket onto the next level a little bit. And so it's 100% cotton, um, mostly leftover yarns, apart from panic buying a bunch more. And so cotton is great for babies because it's machine washable. Um, it's quite absorbent for all of the baby related liquids that may end up going on the blanket. Um, and yeah, it's like breathable. It's, it's not, it's warming, but it's not, it's, it's warming and insulating as cotton as a fibre, but it's not, it doesn't, you know, you don't get too hot. It can also be cooling, um, <laughs> which again is good for babies because it's not good when they overheat. Um, yeah, so like really happy with this blanket. So the reason that I sort of hesitate about the um, yarn a little bit was because I panic bought a lot of yarn, including not just one of every colour that I needed, but I bought two of every colour that I needed just because I've made a few of these kind of crochet baby blankets before and I just had this memory of them just eating up yarn, like just sucking it all up and you're getting like to the, the edges of the big square and just it just taking loads of yarn at once. But I don't know what I, I did differently. I mean, maybe in the past I used fewer colours and therefore the colours seem to deplete more quickly, but I've ended up with four balls of leftover yarn. Now, I actually really like some of this yarn, you know, especially this um, ecru kind of unbleached cream kind of colour. Oh, and it's just very cheap, cheap cotton, like with whatever brand, you know, I just searched for the colour rather than the brand, you know, just deco weight cotton in the, in the right colour. This like nice bright, um, I don't know what you'd call that, sort of like a bright denim or a faded azure blue. It's really pleasant. And this grey, and I actually really like this muted tangerine orange, and I thought, oh, that would be, make a really nice, um, like a holy mesh summer vest kind of thing, or a t-shirt. But I think I'm gonna bite the bullet and I'm going to return these four balls of yarn. So this is probably about only 10 pounds worth of yarn, and it's probably gonna cost me, you know, I had to pay for postage of the yarn, and I'm probably gonna have to, you know, I, I think it's three returns, but I'm not sure, but, I just think, you know, I started off with seven balls of yarn. I don't, I don't want to end up with four balls of yarn because then if you think about taking away of my stash, I've only taken away three balls. And also I've got little bits of leftovers still as it is. So here are the leftovers, so little scraps. So I don't particularly want to have this bundle of scraps and another bundle of four balls of yarn. So I think I'm, yeah, I'm just gonna bite the bullet and just pay and return them and see what kind of money I get back. Um, which, yeah, I don't know, it just feels a bit like one of those weird things in our sort of consumerist mentality. I, I alluded to this on the last episode of The Crimson Stitchery as well, like, oh, it's not really gonna save you money, why bother, send it back, la la la. But, you know, even though, I don't know, it's not gonna save me that much space, but I just feel like for my own mental clarity of trying to use what I have and reduce down my stash and, you know, think about what this project has done in terms of, in terms of reducing the stash, um, yeah, uh, I think I think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna bite the bullet and just just post them back, fill out that returns label, um, and for anyone that's new here to the Crimson Stitchery. Um, 
Ironically, this started in 2020, this stashless project or stashing less project um, at the Crimson Stitchery, which was really an endeavour to go about assessing what we have, you know, taking stock, taking ownership and thinking about maybe even changing our consumer decisions um, and our storage decisions and accumulation um, processes when it comes to yarns and fabrics and tools. And I ran it across 2020, you know, I started it in January before, you know, the pandemic became a thing and then it became a very nice you know, project to do over 2020. And then I think more recently, um, people in our Ravelry group have been take, taking it upon themselves to run it because I haven't, I just haven't had the mental capacity to run like knit alongs or endeavours, group projects and things like that because I'm trying to finish my PhD whilst juggling loads of other stuff. And I'll talk about this a bit later. Um, so I hope that, I hope that by this time next year, like I hope that in the next academic year, my PhD commitments will get dealt with. We'll see. Um, it's a very long process because, um, yeah, anyway, because I, I do really, really, really enjoy the Crimson Stitchery and it's something that um, I want to keep, you know, running throughout my my sort of multifaceted career as a creative. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's probably a bit boring for you, but that's just to let anyone who's an old viewer and a bit curious about how things are going or a new viewer who wonders how everything sort of ties together. Um, it's basically, it's really hard to uh, just have one job today in the UK's job market. Anyway, so that is the baby blanket. So that's probably the most exciting project that I've been working on. Um, the other thing is that I have put quite a lot of work into the blue cotton polo top that I was working on last time. So I think before I had, so, you know, prepare yourself for a bunch of dark navy blue knitted blobs to appear on your screen right now. Um, before I had one short sleeve to which I added this little, um, I added some extra eyelets as a detail. One sleeve, two sleeves. <laughs> um, then last time I was working on the back, so I've done the whole back. And by the way, this is four ply cotton yarn. This is a polo t-shirt with like buttons and a collar that is knitted in pieces. Uh, with four ply yarn, did I mention that one? Really small needles, like three millimeter needles, which I think is like US I don't know, three or something like that, or four. Small needles that are like a 26 stitches per four inches gauge, or maybe even 28. Honestly, I can't remember. I'm just knitting it at this point. So I did this back. Then I did a front. And I did the, uh, I think the left front. Uh, yes, the left front or the right front? Can't figure it out. Anyway, I did, I did the, the, easier, the easier front to do. All you can see is just a rolled tube. And then this will become the button band. That's why it's got um, a safety pin on the edge because I've got to later knit up a button band for that. So yeah, I think yeah. last time I'd started the back and I'd done the sleeves. So then I finished the back and did another sleeve. So that's a nice satisfying pile of knitting there. And then since then I had another cast on and rip it out episode. So I've only got Technically, I've only got the other front and then like the collar, the button bands and all the seaming to do, but there was more of this and now there's not very much. Um, and that's because it was the front which is going to have the button bands. So I guess it, uh, the button holes. <laughs> Sorry. So I guess that's the right front. And basically I miscalculated or miscounted like the stitches between the button holes. So I just got confused and then I just threw it aside and made a baby blanket instead. So I've really got to finish that up. Here is a picture of what the pattern looks like. It's from an old um, back issue of Rowan magazine. And I'm not doing any of the color work. I'm not doing the ribbon because it's from like 2003 and you can tell in the styling. <laughs> so for me, it's going to be a much starker and much plainer, just button up navy blue t-shirt with a collar, basically. Um, good for everyday wear. So yeah, I need to find a way to <laughs> get back to that. 
but um, it's not really high on the priority list now, to be honest with you. Although I do like the idea of, of a knitted, hand-knitted t-shirt. I do like the idea of having more just textured, everyday clothing in plain and simple colours. Um, in the wardrobe, there's something really very appealing about that. Okay, the last project to update you on is my Rami sock that I am knitting for my exhibition. Um, so for anyone that's new, when I was going through one of the archival collections at Kew, I found a commercial sample of a Rami sock in the archive and this was sent to Kew as an example of what could be done with Rami. Um, the sample dates to, oh, I think it was 1908. Um, so yeah, I was basically really taken with the fact that there was this 114 year old odd sock in the archive and it was coral coloured and I just wanted to make my own. So if you don't know what rami is, it's a plant fibre and it is a bast fibre which means that it's made from the stem of a plant. It's quite similar to linen and it's from a plant called Bermeria nivea which is in the same family as nettles but it's not the same as the stinging nettle plant. And I found a yarn that's 70% cotton and 30% rami from a small supplier. And I decided to improvise and knit up my own coral coloured rami sock um, in response to the archival sock. So this is going to go into the exhibition as an artist response. Um, but it's also just been a piece of kind of living and practice based research for me to learn about how uh, rami as a plant fibre functions. Even though it's only 30% rami blended with so much cotton, you can definitely feel the rami. It's a very um, kind of unique fibre that has got its very very strong characteristics and it is physically strong as well. It feels really really dense, it's got a lovely glossiness to it, it's got a lovely sheen. Um, to be honest with you, yeah, you know, Rami is probably wasted on a sock, you know, it's, it's, it's probably probably you should use it for like a lovely little top or a summer shawl um, or some other kind of purposes. So um, it's 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 really it's really quite a beautiful fiber and I definitely recommend it and would like to um, explore it more in the future. It's one of the great outcomes of this project. And um, yeah, I started the second sock. So the thing to note about Rami is that like a lot of plant fibers, it's very, very dense. Um, it doesn't have a lot of natural spring or elas elasticity to the actual yarn. So that's unlike fibers like wool or even, you know, synthetics like acrylic. And because of that, I can only knit a few rows of it at a time and I have to let my hands have a break. So it's been quite a slow process of making it. Um, but Rami is, is such a durable fibre that, you know, I, I really feel like I, I'm looking forward to testing this out eventually uh, by wearing them a lot. And I just, yeah, I would like to, maybe I have to make another pair just for wearing. Um, but yeah, I would like to really just wear it in shoes and just, you know, just observe what, what it's like um, because it's not very common fibre. It's never really been that common. It's always been quite um, specialist. And I think that, um, you know, there was a huge, huge, huge interest in producing um, Rami at, in the early, late 19th and early 20th centuries. But I think with the development of synthetic fibres, you know, that just, that just took off, basically. And then sort of alternative fibres, including Rami, I think they just reduced in popularity. Um, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> as well as the ongoing sort of dominance of cotton in the in the plant fibre sphere. So yeah, it's always been quite speciality. And I am um, going to be, um, as I said, displaying it in the ex exhibition with my bamboo knitting needles still in it, just to make a comment about um, handwork, basically. And it's the way, and, and so it, making this sock and complete and showing them in my exhibition basically completes a loop of research that I've been doing in the archive which was basically that um, in the 19th century there was this huge increase of uh, basically Western, whatever you want to call them, diplomats, scientists, economists, explorers, people that basically went to China after it was quote unquote opened up following China's defeat in the Opium War. So basically there, there had already been Western presence in China but after the Opium War, so from the 1860s onwards, even more Western people got to go there because um, basically China's consumer markets were opened up to Western traders. 
So in a way, it's kind of the opposite of what happened um, with globalization in the 1980s, um, I guess with like the free trade agreement and stuff like that, when Western consumer markets uh, opened up China to manufacturing. You know you, you know what I'm talking about, offshore manufacturing and, and globalised trade and stuff like that. It's kind of similar but different thing that happened um, like 120 or 30 years before in the 19th century. Um, and that's basically some of the archival material that I've been looking at is about plant exploration and, you know, they sent people uh, on all of these journeys to go around China, especially places like Western China and Yunnan and Sichuan, um, to basically observe what all of the local people were doing, what plants they were using, how they were used in their daily lives, and they reported on their uses of, like, food and agriculture, medicinal purposes, obviously, was really, you know, important information that, um, you know, they wanted the, the Europe European botanists wanted to record formally in the scientific method, uh, and also textiles including fibre processing, spinning and dyeing. Um, and so I've been focused on the textile side of that. And so when I say this completes the loop, so the loop is European uh, diplomats slash travellers slash botanists going to China and looking at what rural working class labouring people were doing in order to produce clothing for themselves. They recorded it and sent it back to Q. Um, and it was recorded for the purposes of industrialization. So they were basically trying to look for more products, not just in China, but all around the world. You know, it's the Victorian industrialists that they could scale en masse um, and, you know, adapt to factory production so that it could be mass produced and mass sold at a great profit for the, obviously, the Europeans, not the Chinese. <laughs> um, so it kind of went from local tiny, tiny productions by hands with, you know, individual like individual producers and villagers collecting the plants and processing them by hand. Then it went, that information got gathered and sent back to Europe. Um, it got recorded. They tried to mechanise it. It worked with, you know, they got there with Rami, but then it, it never really became that popular. And then there's this idea of, of, of it then now, you know, fibres like Rami and more unusual plants and, you know, just really looking at um, speciality, you know, hand production again has sort of come full circle, but it's for crafters and makers. Um, so it's just this idea of that about this like Rami sock now is available for me to make as a 21st century <laughs> researcher slash knitter um, slash artist. And it's definitely not being produced in the same way by, you know, um, regional, you know, regional um, mountainous uh, Chinese people, you know, because, um, yeah, because of mass production of, of, um, of clothing. I'm probably not explaining this in the best way possible because I'm kind of like ad-libbing two and a half months of research and many more years of study because I'm a fashion dress and textile specialist um, academically. Um, but let me know if you've got any questions and let me know if this made sense and if you get the gist <laughs> of what I'm saying. Completing loops. So yes, exhibiting it as a handmade object next to a mass-produced object and then I'm also going to have some of the hand process fibres that were collected by the Europeans uh, travellers that w they got from the little villages in the 19th century in like Yunnan in, in the west of China. So it's just all these different stages. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let me put down the Rami. So that is, um, that's that. So I need to do a bit more. Oh, the other thing I mentioned is that I, yeah, it's interesting working with a different fibre rather than wool. And it just goes to show that like knitting socks is like an ongoing process that you're always learning about, even, even when you've been doing it for a long time. But when you change the variables like different fibre, for instance, you know, there, there always is more to learn when it comes around that. So that's been a really interesting process to sort of reinvent um, sock knitting processes for me. And I think that my, the, the finished sock that I made is actually a little bit too small. Um, so I'm going to have to cut the toe off and, and make it just like um, half an inch or two centimetres longer in the foot. Because, yeah, just the way that the ease and the stretch and the vertical stretch, horizontal stretch of the fabric, just the way that that works is a little bit different from a conventional four-ply sock yarn that is, you know, 75% superwash wool and 20% nylon. So, yeah, really fascinating. And I'm going to carry on um, exploring and updating you guys about plant fibres. And, yeah, thanks for your... In 
hopefully that hopefully all of this has been of interest to you but like I said you know you are watching like a live you know real life <laughs> development of practice and thinking I'm not coming to, to you at the end when like everything is honed and polished but I'm very much in the middle of figuring out not only this project but my career <laughs> so thanks for thanks for being here I really really appreciate you really do um, okay, so that's knitting and crochet. And then I promised you larder life. And larder life is a section where I talk about kitchen and garden endeavors, generally things to do with growing and preserving what has been grown. So I tried out a new recipe. Okay, I come bearing jars, I come bearing kilner jars. Um, <laughs> all right, so the first thing I'll show you so I can put it down. This one is really simple. This one is cold brew tea. So cold brew iced tea. So just to like save a little bit of money on buying um, drinks that are not, oh, let's face it, let's just face it, just to try and drink a bit less wine. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and not drink like fizzy drinks and sodas and things like that and save a bit of money. Um, I tried out a cold brew tea recipe, so that's really easy. It just So here I've got um, a favourite tea which is called Earl Green, so it's green tea with bergamot flavouring. And um, it's a tea that I actually got from Sweden and it's Cobb's tea. It's really common in Sweden, it's loose leaf tea but you can just get it in all of the major supermarkets and I love it. And yeah, when I visited um, a friend in Malmö in July, I made sure that I rushed to the supermarket and grabbed a packet of tea to stuff into my pocket, not even in my hand luggage because they've reduced the size of hand luggage so, mu so much, so much, like <laughs> I had to try and stuff a packet of tea in my pocket um, so that I could fit a box of, uh, you know, ginger snaps, pepper kako in my, in my actual backpack. <laughs> um, and now, now I'm rationing that out. Anyway, I just really like this tea. And yeah, it's not something that's available in the UK. So if anyone wants to send me a Swedish care package, um, yeah. So all you do is mix in um, cold water with a couple of teaspoons of tea. It takes a while to work out the ratios. You just have to figure it out for yourself rather than, um, you know, following some guides online. Like, no, you just need to figure out for yourself how much how much tea to water according to your vessel. And then you can leave it as is, or sometimes I add in like a teaspoon of sugar, not too much. And you just put it in the fridge. And this has been in the fridge for quite a while because I forgot about it. But it takes quite a while for the tea to extract into the cold water. And the idea is that the cold water, rather than using hot um, water that's off the boil, it's less harsh, so it doesn't destroy the, the oils and stuff in the tea leaves so that the extraction is obviously really slow but it's a bit less harsh um, and apparently you get different flavours but for me it's just like an easy cheap thing to do you stick it in the fridge you forget about it stir it um, whenever you remember at least once a week to prevent like bacteria and mold growths even though that, that's unlikely to happen in the fridge but it's just a good practice generally for when you're making these long-term things it's not kombucha or anything like that it's literally cold brew tea and then i just pour myself a little small glass of it and drink it instead of like a juice and yeah it's water a teaspoon of sugar and some tea leaves so it costs next to nothing and you can use bigger quantities but this is just the jar that i had on hand so that's cold brew tea okay now i'm a bit better balanced so the next thing that i did and this took quite a while. Can you see that? Can you see those lumpy forms? This is a preserve of unripe figs in honey. And I found this recipe in the newspaper, I'll put a link to it down below, and I was just really intrigued by it because um, I've got a fig tree and I often try and make fig chutney, but according to what the weather is like, you know, in the UK, um, it can be difficult to get the figs from the fig tree um because obviously we're in the northern hemisphere yes we do have you know hot summers especially this year there's been a heat wave but often the figs will kind of have a growth spurt from the hot summer and then it will get to uh, it they'll have a growth spurt but they won't ripen in the summer they don't ripen until a few months later but by that time it's got quite cold in the late autumn and they often just fall off the tree or they shrivel and die or they don't fully ripen because by the time they've got big enough to be a decent fruit and, and to sort of soften on the inside, you know, they'll just get blasted by cold and they'll be green. So this year I thought, okay, I found this recipe for unripe figs and I thought, let me try and do something with it while they're still unripe, while they're still on the tree before they all disappear. Because sometimes they literally, it's like they disappear into, into air because they just, yeah, anyway, probably get eaten by squirrels. 
and so I followed the recipe and it's it's really weird. Now <laughs> it took quite a while to make, it involved pickling the figs in salt for quite a long time, then you like boil them in honey and I also added in a couple of sticks of cassia bark which is a type of cinnamon. Um, just because it's what I had at home and I thought, yeah, let's get it to have a bit more flavour. I used really cheap honey, nothing special, luxurious or particularly ethical, I'm afraid, just really cheap honey from the supermarket. And it is so strange. It's the kind of, um, it's the kind of, like, preserve that I, I imagine that you would eat in a really posh restaurant and they'd give you like the tiniest thin slice and they'd put it on a tiny, tiny little bellini cracker that they hand piped and they'd put some like caviar and some ancient crumbling stinky cheese on it and a tiny bit of this unripe fig and honey preserve. And it's so bizarre because it's got the honey but it's full of salt, it's really savoury and then the fig was unripe but it's incredibly fragrant and the taste is just, it's just weird. <laughs> so I think I made like half the recipe and I still ended up with this jar and another jam jar size. Um, and uh, I've eaten like half of one and I really don't see myself eating the rest. So I am glad that I tried this recipe out because I was curious. But um, anyway, let me know if you make it and what you think. It's just really strange. I, I think I need to find someone with a more like elegant and elegant and experimental palette because I can't find anyone that will eat this with me, quite frankly. Um, I'm not sure what to eat it with. I think probably a really stinky cheese. I tried it with some burrata. I tried it with some goat's cheese. Both of them were just too fine and creamy for this. I think it needs something robust. So that's that. And then the last bit of preserving I just started um, yesterday because I basically had this kiwi in my fruit bowl all summer. I don't know, I just didn't eat it. And then I finally cut it in half and I was just hit by this yeasty and alcoholic aroma that came out of the kiwi because it was too ripe. Um, and so I had the idea to try and turn it into a kiwi fruit vinegar. This is a, a pretty easy thing to do. It takes quite a long time. You just put um, fruit with water, basically. Now you need quite a lot of fruit and I only had the one kiwi. So yeah, I put in the kiwi and a couple of apple cores. So all you do is just mix it in with some water. And the crazy thing is, is that as soon as I put the kiwi in the water, I kind of stirred it for a bit and mushed it up. For the whole rest of the day, the entire jar was bubbling away like it had been carbonated. And obviously that's because of the, the yeast that was in the kiwi because it was overripe, right? it just continued to release those chemicals and it was really like sparkling away. It was quite impressive. So I do think that this is going to turn into vinegar. Um, and I just think, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting. If I see some like cheap kiwis at the market, you know, that are like overripe and being sold for next to nothing, I might just buy them and, and shove it in. But um, yeah, you just put fruit in water, you keep stirring it and then you, um, you know, the fruit releases all of the, bacteria and then there you have the, oh god I'm not explaining this very well, basically there, there's bacteria in the fruit which um, produce vinegar um, when exposed to air and that is the bacteria that will, it's the same bacteria that you know if you leave a bottle of wine out without the lid on, without the cork in, it will make the wine taste of vinegar, it's, it's that process um, but it takes weeks. So <laughs> I, I'll leave a link down below to like a blog post about, uh, about it as well in case you're interested. So we'll see how my fruit vinegars go. And that's really everything that I've got to share with you this month. I just really wanted to check in because I felt like I'd been doing a lot of making and also that I missed chatting with you guys. Um, I've been trying to release tutorials in between the vlogs, you know, either tutorials or like helpful videos, but I definitely miss miss doing the vlogs as well. I feel like this is a good time to end. But um, as always, I would really, really like to hear from you guys and let me know if you've been experimenting with any yarns or fibres recently or um, or even in the kitchen. Um, thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I feel like things have been, things have been unusual in the last, obviously, well, basically things have been weird ever since the pandemic. And I had been trying to buckle down and get my PhD finished, but then basically I got, I, I, had, I had the opportunity to apply for this artist residency at Kew that's now been um, actually been extended because it's proving really successful. And so I've basically got to do that and then finish my PhD. Um, and 
and also carry on trying to keep the Crimson Stitch Tree ticking by. So it's quite a lot to, to juggle. Um, but honestly, it's not really a very big secret how few opportunities are out there for young academic researchers and how badly paid they are. <laughs> I will leave a link down below to an article that kind of exposes the situation that other people like me or even people other who have, who have finished their PhDs have been placed in, um, just to give you a little bit of context. And I feel really fortunate in that I have grown this YouTube channel and I found a little tiny, tiny, tiny niche where I can talk about making and knitting and creativity and also go on long rambling tangents about my various aspects of academic research. And <laughs> we can talk about things like socks and I can tell you how to do a cast on and stuff like that. Um, it's definitely something that I want to nurture going forward. It just has to be, you know, it can only be at the pace that I can manage, which at the moment is a snail's pace. So what I'm trying to say is I am always really grateful for the fact that you are here watching and an extra special big thank you to all of my supporters either on Patreon or the people that have bought me a coffee over on Ko-Fi. The links are down below. And I'd like to give a shout out to this month's Patreon supporters at the Crimson Queens tier. Thank you so much. Angie Scheitel, and also a huge thank you to Brittany Cook. I really, really appreciate your support. So that's everything from me today. Thank you for watching and keeping with me. I hope that you are doing well this October and I'll speak to you again sometimes at the Crimson Stitchery soon. Bye-bye.